Hey folks, so today we're going to talk about loading performance on the web. Mobile has changed everything. It challenges the way that we deliver modern user experiences on the web, and the shape of success over the next year is going to be whatever lets us ship the least amount of code while still delivering value to our user experiences. Now, what actually impacts loading? There's a number of things on mobile that, that can impact it. Um, it could be slow networks, it could be thermal throttling, parsing JavaScript, cache eviction. In fact, there are so many things that can impact how slowly a page loads that we simply don't have enough time to cover all of them in a single talk today. Some of the things that we've seen teams successfully use to ship fast and deliver fast experiences have included things like shipping less JavaScript down the wire, caching effectively using HTTP caching and service workers to be resilient against the network, preloading critical resources, but what end goal are we actually trying to accomplish using these best practices? Well, it's a lot to do with user expectations. Now, to talk a little bit more and illustrate user expectations, I'd like to introduce you to Gary. So Gary is trying to load up a web page on slow 3G on an average phone. He's been waiting a few seconds, and he hasn't got any meaningful content on there just yet. He can't even read the text of this article just yet. Poor Gary. At this point, he's starting to question his life choices. He's wondering if he should have tried loading this page up on a slightly more capable device, like a Tamagotchi, <laughs> or maybe a Fisher-Price My First Laptop, or maybe even an Abacus. Poor Gary. So talking about you know, expectations a little bit more, back in 2015, we introduced Rail, a user-centric performance model. Rail had this idea for load where we tried to encourage folks shipping down you know, main content for the page in under 1,000 milliseconds. Now, the reality is that on slow 3G, that's, that's really hard to accomplish. But it also doesn't talk too much about you know, this idea that loading is kind of a journey. And so over the last year and a bit, we've been focused on a newer set of user happiness metrics that culminate in time to interactive. This point during the loading of a page that we think that the user is probably going to be able to accomplish useful actions. Things like being able to tap around, hit menus, hit buttons, actually have something useful happen. So a lot of the things we talk about today are going to be focused on this idea of improving time to interactivity. Now Alex Russell says of developing for mobile, that network CPUs and disks are not our best friend. The reality is that as we shift to more client-heavy architectures, we can end up paying for the things that we send down in ways that are not always that obvious. In the traces that we see today as we profile different teams' sites, JavaScript ends up being one of the heaviest costs that we experience. In fact, the cost of parsing JavaScript is quite heavy. Here's a breakdown of the, of the time it takes to parse JavaScript on modern devices, so high-end devices at the very top, average devices in the middle, and then slightly lower-end devices all the way down. This is for a meg of decompressed script. Take a look at the delta in how long it takes to parse script on a very, very high-end phone versus something more average, like the Moto G4 that your users probably have out in the wild. We can zoom in on this. We can actually take a look at a real site like CNN, and if we compare the performance of processing script on something like at the, the uh, A11 Bionic chip in the iPhone 8 takes about four seconds. Moto G4 takes an additional nine. Imagine how long that's going to push out how quickly you are able to get interactive. So there are still opportunities for us to do better here. Whenever you're developing a modern mobile experience, it's very important to be testing on representative average hardware. Now, over the last year, we've seen some teams have success with the purple pattern. Purple is a pattern that shows you through aggressive code splitting, how you can actually get interactive really quickly. So it has this idea of pushing the minimal code, need to get interactive, you try to render that really quickly. You then use Service Worker for pre-caching resources, so you don't have to keep going back out to the network, and then you lazy load routes as they're needed. This is a pattern that's been used by sites like Wego and is baked in to modern toolkits like Polymer App Toolbox and Preact CLI. I wanted to take a data-driven approach to explaining why patterns like this are useful. Here's the V8 runtime call stats. This is basically a granular look at where JavaScript engines like V8 spend their time. Of 10 popular progressive web apps, mobile sites, what we can see in orange is that parse dominates in many cases the amount of time that we're spending here. And all the way down at the bottom, we see sites like Wego using the purple pattern. They're actually not spending as long in parse and are able to get interactive much more quickly. 
So opportunities, again, for us to try making sure that the tooling that we use these days tries to prescribe you best practices for performance out of the box. Earlier, I talked about Chrome's cache. I talked about caching. Uh, something that we haven't shared before, actually, is Chrome's cache hit rates. This is what it looks like. So here we have a breakdown of cache hit rates for CSS, JavaScript, fonts, and images. Now we have memory and HTTP cache shown in this table. In most cases, when a web page needs a resource, Chrome starts by looking it up in the memory cache. If that cache doesn't have it, Chrome's then going to go out to the network stack and eventually try getting it from the HTTP cache. What we can see is that CSS has got a relatively decent cache hit rate. But take a look at JavaScript. What we can see there is that we've got a pretty poor cache hit rate. And it could be for a number of reasons. It could be because we're you know, pushing out new releases way too often and invalidating those cache JavaScript bundles. It could be because we just don't have decent enough HTTP caching headers set. So opportunities for us to do much better there. Now, when it comes to being successful at optimizing your load performance, we've seen teams have great success by making sure that the entire team owns performance as a topic. And setting performance budgets can really, really have a big impact here. So let's talk about budgets for things like Time to Interactive. If we set a budget of about five seconds or under for Time to Interactive on first load, and let's say that we take a global baseline of a $200 Android device on a 400 kilobytes link with a 400 milliseconds round trip time, this can end up translating into a budget of about 160 to 170 kilobytes for our critical resources. We can zoom in on this a little bit more. And what we see is that that's composed of a lot of different things. That budget includes your application logic, your framework, which could be anywhere between 4 to 40 kilobytes, your ecosystem pieces, like your router, your state management, your utilities. And a question that you have to ask yourself is how much headroom do these ecosystem choices end up leaving you for your actual application code? Now, as you're trying to decide on these things, it's very important to carefully evaluate those libraries, those frameworks that you're using when you're trying to build for mobile. Take a look at their network transfer costs, their parse and compile times, and whether they introduce any additional runtime costs, like long tasks being added into the page that can end up janking the user experience. So if you're trying to be successful on mobile, what we suggest is this. This is a good recipe. Develop on an average phone so that you can feel those CPU and GPU limits. Keep your JavaScript parse and compile time relatively low, and have a good performance budget in place. So five seconds for first load, under two seconds for repeat visits. Now, there are a number of good tools available for performance budgeting. Some that we've tried out and really enjoy are Caliber, Speed Curve, and Bundle Size. We've seen teams use these, as well as many other tools like Webpack's performance budgets, with some great success. And if you're interested in learning more about this topic, Alex Russell just um, published a really awesome article on this topic uh, where he asks, can you afford it? Um, and he talks about real-world performance budgets. So check that out. Next, let's switch it up and talk about the health of the web as a whole. Now, over the last few years, we've given you good tools for understanding the state of your performance in synthetic lab conditions. Things like the Chrome Dev Tools, Lighthouse, Web Page Test, as well as suggested using RUM for understanding the performance your users experience out there in the wild. We've also given you good tools for understanding trends. So things like HTTP Archive. So you can take a look at how the web is constructed and get insights like, you know, what is the average size of the images folks are sending down? What is the median size of those types of resources? Now, if you've checked out HTTP Archive before, you might know that it doesn't include a lot of those modern metrics that I was talking about earlier. It also doesn't include some of those graphs that we were highlighting. And so today, we'd like to change that. I'm happy to introduce a new version of HTTP Archive, the HTTP Archive Beta. This is available at beta.htparchive.org. And I'm pretty, key, I'm pretty stoked, actually, about this release because it gives you access to a lot more data, a lot more power to get insight. It includes things like response bodies for CSS, HTML, and JavaScript, Lighthouse reports for hundreds of thousands of sites, Blink feature counters, those newer performance metrics, and all of this is queryable. What does this mean for you? Well, it means that you are able to get insights such as the state of JavaScript on mobile. So what we can learn from this is that at the 90th percentile, sites are shipping down about a megabyte of gzip JavaScript. Decompressed, that's going to be even larger when it comes to parse costs. And we're seeing the sites end up spending four seconds parsing and compiling that code. Are sites using a meg of JavaScript up front? Well, we actually took a look at the top 50 sites, and using the Chrome Remote Debugging Protocol, the DevTools Remote Debugging Protocol, we actually discovered that most of those sites consistently only used 40% of the code that they loaded on load. 
We also took a look at this 30 seconds in to the page and discovered that the situation didn't really change. And what this highlights is opportunities for us to be shipping less JavaScript down to our users, taking advantage of patterns like code splitting, and just ensuring that we're reducing our network transmission costs as well for these types of codes. We can also take a look at the state of the web on mobile. And we can see at the 90th percentile, sites are shipping down almost 5.5 megabytes of resources. 70% of this is images. So still opportunities there for us to be compressing things better, using things like MozJPEG or WebP to reduce how much we're actually sending down over the wire. And we can also take a look at web speed metrics, like time to interactive. And at the 90th percentile, sites are taking 35 seconds before they're interactive. That's 30 seconds longer than the budgets that we're prescribing today. So we still have some work to do there if we don't want to make Gary sad. So that's HP Archive beta. The reality is that out in the wild, demographics can vary pretty wildly for your real users. Some users are going to have a crappy device. Some are going to have a crappy network. And your competitors may have a faster experience than you do. Wouldn't it be useful if we had something like HP Archive, but which gave us queryable RUM for the web? Now, to talk about a new initiative here um, that's going to help, I'd like to introduce to the stage Ilya Grigorik and Brian McQuaid. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Addy. Hey, folks. So as I'm sure you've experienced yourselves, scanning the headlines on any given day, it's inspiring to see examples of well-optimized sites delivering great user experience. But at the same time, there are also definitely pockets on the web where we all know we need to do better. And honestly, sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell, looking at the headlines, whether we're making progress overall on the web. Are we improving the user experience? And therein is actually one of the big challenges that we have both as site developers and browser developers. How do we understand the macro trends of where the web is heading? How do we find examples beyond just the great examples that we're highlighting here at CDS of great user experiences and that we should learn from? And similarly, where do we focus our attention to improve the overall experience on the web? So to address that question, we're actually announcing the Chrome User Experience Report today which is a public data set that we're hosting on BigQuery. And the data set provides a set of key user experience metrics. And initially, we're focusing on loading performance. And of course, Addy mentioned a lot of other metrics. And we're hoping to uh, add more, uh, more metrics in the future. The report will also provide a sample of 10,000 origins, which is something we're also hoping to improve in the future. And I know what you're thinking. Show me the data. So let's actually take a look at the schema. So first of all, a high-level overview. The report itself uh, is aggregated by origin and keyed by origin. So you'll have example.com. And we're providing two key dimensions that we found to be critical when actually working with this data ourselves. The first one is a form factor. So you can segregate this data by uh, tablet, phone, or desktop. Second one is the effective connection type, which is determined by the network information API. And this one is actually powered by real user measurement data uh, based on the round trip time and the download speeds on the client. So you can tell if the connection is fast or slow based on the actual user experience. You can be on Wi-Fi connection that can feel very slow, and it will say so uh, in this case. And then finally, we have a set of metrics. And as I mentioned, we're focusing on uh, loading metrics to, to start. So we're starting with uh, the four that we have here. First of all, the Paint API. So first Paint and first Contentful Paint. Getting stuff on the screen is important just to give a uh, user perception that stuff is happening. And of course, DOM content loaded and unload defined by the HTML standard. So those are the four metrics. Finally, we have the actual histograms. So all the data is split into time slices. And each slice has a start and an end and a density value, which is the fraction of uh, page loads that fall into that range. And uh, with that, I'll let uh, Brian pull back the curtain a little. All right, thanks, Ilya. I'm Brian McQuaid. I'm a software engineer at Google. And I work on making Chrome and the web faster. Uh, so let's dig into the uh, data in the BigQuery uh, table for the Chrome User Experience Report. Uh, we'll uh, you know, see what kinds of questions we can answer and what kind of insights we can gather from digging into the data. So here, let's take a look at here's our first query. We'll look at a few queries and work through things um, here in the BigQuery web UI. And so what, uh, what we're doing here is uh, this query will help us answer the question, what percent of page loads on the www.google.com origin result in a fast first contentful paint. And so we're defining fast first contentful paint here as a first contentful paint that happens within one second. 
If you've seen some of Ilya's past talks or you're familiar with Jacob Nielsen's work, you may know that uh, you know, one second is that threshold of time uh, where a user uh, has their train of thought typically interrupted after that point, right? So ideally, we'd like to keep as many of our page loads under that threshold as possible. So let's go ahead and run the query and see how we're doing. So here we can see at the bottom we've got our results. Uh, and we can see that 81% uh, of uh, the loads on www.google.com are below the th threshold. So generally, we're doing really well here, uh, which is great. So let's take a look just at a couple pieces of the query. So first, you know, here we've got the name of the table we're querying. So this is the Chrome User Experience Report table for 2017 October, it's the initial release. We're querying the first contentful paint metric. And what we're doing with that metric is we're summing all of the density values that Ilya talked about for the histogram bins for that metric, but only where uh, they represent uh, samples that were recorded in less than a second or less than 1,000 milliseconds. All right, so there's that query. Let's drill down a little bit. One of the things you know, we've talked about that the data set enables is also drilling down uh, on certain dimensions, right? So let's take a look at performance broken down by phone versus desktop for Google News. So here we've got uh, our query. We're going to update it to group by and aggregate on form factor, which breaks up by phone and desktop. Um, we do have to add a little bit extra to the query here, because since we're no longer aggregating at the origin level, we have to normalize. Um, so we're sort of dividing the uh, bins that meet our goal, or our threshold, by the total bins in the aggregation criteria. And you can learn more about that in the documentation. Um, but let's go ahead, and we'll dive in and run this, and let's see how we're doing broken down by phone versus desktop. And so we can see here that, you know, well, on desktop, we're doing reasonably well, right? Almost half of page loads uh, are completing under our target threshold, our fast threshold. Uh, we've got a little bit of work to do, it looks like, on phone, right? So this breakdown really helps to give insight into um, differences in performance, right, between phone and desktop. And we see this pretty commonly for origins on the web, right? So we definitely recommend that as you're digging into the data and analyzing origins, you do these kind of breakdowns to see if the performance differs in the two dimensions, or in the two phone and desktop breakouts. All right, so one more query. Uh, one of the things that the Chrome User Experience Report enables us to do is to compare performance across different origins. So let's finish up with uh, an analysis of uh, the Google.com origins in the data set, right? So we've got a wildcard query here, and we can run that, and we get more data. And here, because we're sorted by you know, fastest, we can see sort of our fastest performing origins uh, at the top of the, uh, of the set here. Um, and then if we were to page through the data, we would see uh, areas you know, where we can improve as well. So, um, so these are the kinds of insights that the data set enables. Um, we definitely uh, encourage you to dig in and see what you can find and share feedback with us to let us know how we can make it more useful. And the last example that Brian gave here is actually a great demonstration of the underlying power of the data set, where you can actually look across the web and figure out what are the trends, how, how is the user experience changing. And let's go to the next slide here. Oops. I'm going backwards. Uh, but one of the things that we discovered as we've been looking at the data set itself uh, is you have to be careful when you're working with real user measurement data because the population of users that visits the website actually affects the performance, which should be intuitive, but just as an example. I can have a small site that is visited by users that happen to be on fast hardware and on fast networks. And the site may not be well optimized, and it may appear fast. And vice versa, you can have a big service like, say, Google News, uh, which is visited by a very diverse set of users with a wider distribution of hardware and on slower networks. And that will be reflected in the data. So when you're comparing origins, you should be careful with drawing conclusions and kind of try to control for those things. So as Brian mentioned, we document some of these best practices in our documentation. And uh, on that note, to get started, uh, please check out our blog post, which has more details on the announcement and how to access the data set. And it has a link to the developer docs, which have a walkthrough guide for how to get started with BigQuery if you have not used it before, plus some sample queries that you can run, similar to what you've seen here. And you can start kind of getting a feel for the data itself. And with that, I'm super keen to see what you guys will build with this data. And uh, let's welcome Addy back on stage. Thank you. So that was the Chrome User Experience Report. 
As a browser, what's Chrome doing to give you, as developers, more power to control your loading experience? Well, over the last year, we've been working on a few new features. The first of these is Font Display, which we introduced in Chrome 60, and is now available as a uh, work in progress in Safari and Firefox. Font Display, uh, as a descriptor, allows you as a developer to decide how your web fonts are going to render or fall back, depending on how long it takes for them to load. I personally love using Font Display Optional, because it basically says, if a web font can't load quickly, don't load it at all. If it happens to be in the user's cache, the next time that they come and visit the experience, we can then consume it. But otherwise, we don't end up blocking for it. You've also asked for the ability to adapt the content that you serve down to users based on the estimated network quality. Now, Chrome's had the Network Information API for a while, but it kind of only provided you theoretical network speeds. Imagine being on Wi-Fi, but connected to a cellular hotspot and only getting 2G speeds. Well, navigator.connection.type would have effectively given you that. It would have told you that you're on Wi-Fi, and we'd end up shipping you down a much, much larger video file in this case. Over in Chrome 62, we introduced um, effective type, a newer property. And this uses the new uh, network estimation quality work that we've been doing in Chrome. This uses RTT and downlink values. And effectively, what this allows you to do is get a much clearer picture on the actual effective connection type that the user has. So you can make sure that you're giving them a slightly more accurate representation of data that their connection can handle. For many of us in this room, we're used to building single page applications. And our waterfalls can end up looking a little bit like this. We push down some HTML, which then requires some JavaScript to be fetched before we go and you know, query an API for some JSON responses. Now, the way that we've given you to control a little bit more of your loading uh, in the past, back in Chrome 50, is link rel preload, something that's making its way to other browsers. And this basically allowed you to tell the browser that there are late discovered resources that are pretty critical to your experience. And can it try loading those up much earlier on? Now, in Chrome, up until Chrome 62, you weren't able to use the Fetch API with this. General goal of preload, once again, is starting the load of that resource um, without having to wait for the timing for scripts or elements to request them. And you can now use this consistently with the Fetch API as well. So Fetch API and preload work together now. And for folks that have been building progressive web apps, there have been some situations where your service worker boot up time can end up delaying a network response. Navigation preload, something that we introduced in Chrome 59, allows you to fix this by allowing you to make the request in parallel with your service worker boot up time. So in cases where on particularly slow connections and slow devices, you can end up with you know, a few hundred milliseconds delaying overall service worker boot up, this can now improve things. And at the 95th percentile, our current estimates are that this can end up saving folks anywhere up to 20% on their page load time. So exciting work being done there. What's up for the future? So uh, we're working on a few things. Uh, we're working on trying to improve the performance of our ES modules implementation. Today, you currently still need to bundle for most cases in production. On the service worker front, we are working on off main thread fetch and script streaming. And we're also working on a new navigation architecture for loading that should hopefully lead to some improvements in time to first contentful paint. And over the last year, we've talked a lot about progressive web apps and how, in many cases, they're becoming the new normal for new mobile web experiences. And today, we've got some new ones to share. So please join me in welcoming to the Progressive Web App family two new sites. So let's start off with Pinterest. Pinterest spent three months building out the logged in experience for their Progressive Web App, which is now rolled out to 100% of users. This started because they were focused on international growth. And when they took a look at their old mobile web experience, which often pointed folks to the native app, they discovered that not as many people were actually clicking through and installing the app, which made, you know, uh, it kind of made sense for them to explore mobile web as, as an opportunity for improving their conversion rates. So they ended up building this experience. It didn't take too long to get the initial version out. This is based on React, React Redux, um, and React Router with Webpack. I kind of love Pinterest. I'm a heavy Pinterest user myself. It allows me to take a look at some really beautiful crayon art that people end up creating. And it also saves me time, because it shows me what my version of this would also look like, so I don't have to do it myself. But thank you, Pinterest. Taking a look at the performance of the old Pinterest site, what we can see on first load is that they used to get interactive 
in over 20 seconds. It would often take 23, 30 seconds before you could actually interact with those pages and start saving your pins. I'm happy to say that with the new progressive web app experience that they've just shipped, this changes quite a lot. They're now able to get interactive in under 5.6 seconds. So really nice boost there. They've also managed to drop down the sizes of their JavaScript bundles all the way down to 150 kilobytes. They've reduced the sizes of their CSS bundles. At the 90th percentile, the time it takes to load up pin pages is also down. And on repeat loads, thanks to service worker caching, they're actually able to boot up and get interactive in under four seconds on average mobile hardware, which, is, which has been great to see. Now we can compare this to some of their native applications as well. So this isn't necessarily an apples to apples comparison, but I will say that for the core home feed experience, um, what you're able to get in under 150 kilobytes is reflective of the same experience delivered in 56 megs of their native app on iOS, 9.6 megs on Android. Now you could say that, yeah, as you, you know, navigate through this experience, you are going to end up fetching more data, but this cost is amortized over the lifetime of the application, as those subsequent navigations don't end up costing quite as much data as the native apps do. We can take a look at the business metrics um, off the back of this, and, and I was quite happy to see these as well. We can see comparing the old mobile website to the new PWA is that time spent in the application is up 40%. User-generated ad dollars are up by 44%. Core engagements are up. But we can also see compared to the native app, the time spent is also up in the PWA compared to that baseline, as well as user-generated ad dollars. If you're a developer like me, you probably care more about their JavaScript serving strategy. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, Pinterest are using uh, an interesting bundle splitting strategy where they have a vendor chunk, which is used for their framework and library codes, so their React, their Redux, their React routers. They have entry chunks for their core logic. And then they have asynchronous chunks for anything that's lazily loaded in later on. Their Webpack configuration looks a little bit like this. It's using the Commons chunk plugin. They maintain a list of all the different frameworks and libraries that end up getting you know, squashed into that vendor bundle. They're using things like React Router for their uh, overall code splitting and lazy loading story. So in this case, they're using Webpack's magic comments. They're creating a loader, registering it to a particular pin route, rendering the route with React Router 4, asynchronously loading route bundles with pure components as needed, and rendering components as they're needed, which has been cool to see. Something of a trend that I keep seeing with teams that we work with is the value that they've gotten out of close bundle analysis. So this is what uh, their Webpack bundle analysis output looks like. And what you can notice in the purples, the blues, and the, uh, the blues and the pinks is that this represents asynchronous chunks of code that included some duplicates. So they had duplicate logic across a lot of these different chunks. And through using Webpack Bundle Analyzer, they were actually able to discover opportunities where they could move a lot of that common code all the way into their entry chunk, which increased the size of that chunk by 20%, but actually decreased the size of all of the asynchronous chunks by anywhere up to 90%. It's really great to see. On the service workers front, uh, they were able to explore a, a very iterative approach to adopting service workers. So they initially started off by just runtime caching asynchronous chunks of JavaScript so that they could be opted in to V8's bytecode cache. They then moved on to doing this for vendor chunks, their most popular routes. There were global sites. They also did this for their locale bundles. And eventually, they ended up using the application shell pattern and a cache-first approach to their JavaScript and CSS. Now, Pinterest are planning a few other additions in the future. They're working on web push notification support, trying to fix some desktop error decisions that led to some slower API responses than they'd like, and also adding link rel preload in for preloading their JavaScript bundles. Next up, we've got Tinder. So Tinder swiped right on the mobile web, which was cool to see. They added support for things like service workers, add to home screen, push notifications for chat. And the original MVP of this took about six weeks to build out, and then three months to actually initially launch. This has been something that they've been building as an opportunity to explore other markets, and it's also built on React and Redux. It's rolled out globally to 100% of users right now, and initial signs are, are positive. Um, also taking a look at sort of the uh, amount of code that's necessary to ship down their core experience, Tinder were able to deliver that core experience in about 10% of the data investment for someone in a data costly or data scarce market compared to the Android native app. So, Metrics at the moment are looking positive, and I'm looking forward to Tinder sharing a few more concrete details about this in the near future. Let's take a look at their performance. So some Lighthouse reports. 
Uh, before they started work on this, they were getting interactive in about 7.7 seconds. After it, they managed to shave off about 1.5 seconds. And one of the ways that Tinder accomplished this was by adopting some really, really concrete performance budgets. Remember, we were talking about the, the importance and the need of performance budgets earlier on. And so they have performance budgets for all their different types of chunks. They have a 155 kilobyte budget for their vendor chunks, so their, their framework code. Asynchronous chunks also have a budget, as well as CSS. The approach that they took to code splitting was moving away from statically importing in everything in one go over to using things like React Router, React Loadable, and the Commons Chunk plugin so that they were only including in code that they needed when the user would actually need it. They also took advantage of React Loadable support for preloading scripts. And this just meant that there were opportunities to preload in scripts for additional views so that they were probably in the cache when the user needed them in a future point in time. Taking a look at the impact of this, adopting code splitting for Tinder ended up taking load time from about 12 seconds all the way down to 4.69. From their Google Analytics, we can also see that the average user is able to load up this experience in under six seconds, which is a lot better than the older experience that they previously shipped. Tinder also adopted the link rel preload. They previously had a situation where some of their scripts were being loaded early on, some of them were being discovered late. And so using link rel preload, they were actually able to push all of this work much, much closer to parse time. And this actually able, uh, gave them an opportunity to reduce first paint by 500 milliseconds and load time by one second. We were talking about Webpack bundle analysis earlier. And Tinder were no different. They actually found great value in closely looking at their dependency graph for areas of opportunity to reduce. They found that they were shipping down a lot of unused polyfills. And so they used Babel preset env to address that situation. They used Lodash Webpack plugin to strip away parts of Lodash that they didn't actually need to be shipping down to their users. They replaced local forage with raw index DB, as well as a number of optimizations for CSS that, in a whole, actually dropped down load time, furthermore, at this point in time, to 4.5 seconds. They also adopted a CSS loading strategy. So um, they now use Atomic CSS to create highly reusable CSS styles. And the idea here is that most of the style is all, if, if most of the style has already been sort of fetched and it's in the, net, the HTTP cache, then you can cache it for longer and it doesn't have to be refetched for every release because you're doing it in a much more granular way. So this also led to decreases at that point in time in overall page load time, which is awesome. And finally, uh, well, almost finally, uh, they updated to Webpack 3 very recently and saw a reduction in JavaScript parsing time of 8%. So they're using the module concatenation plugin in there as well. They also recently updated to the latest version of React, React 16, and saw a reduction of almost 7% in their vendor chunk sizes. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about Workbox in the next talk, but Tinder were also using Workbox for their offline caching, their service worker story. Jeff Posnick is going to talk a little bit about this in his talk. But that's it for Tinder. Improving performance is a journey. It's not something that you just do in a single sprint and then leave alone. It's something that you iterate on over time. And lots of small changes can actually end up leading to large gains. What I'd like you to take away from this talk is not like going back to your boss later on today and saying, I sat through 3,000 Addy slides, and now we have to rewrite everything. Instead, if you're starting a new project, just consider picking a set of tools that give you a strong performance baseline. And if you've got an existing experience that could use some work, just remember mom. Measure, optimize, and monitor. Because there are probably opportunities there for you to do better than the baseline that you're shipping to users today on mobile. That's it for me. I hope that you found this useful. Thank you. <laughs>